Hello everyone. This is our second half of our first week, the second half of our lesson on Restoration Voices, writing from the second half of the 17th century, the second half of the 1600s in England, a period of turmoil, a period of challenge, and a period in which the modern English society was shaped, reshaped, debated, and forged. We're listening to a piece from that time, piece, the last piece by Henry Purcell. Purcell was a Restoration composer. This is actually from an opera that Purcell was trying, was composing based on a play by John Dryden. It's important to note that while we're talking about, uh, we've been talking about poems and today we're going to talk about other forms, um, the actual dominant form of the uh, dominant art form the signal or signature art form of the Restoration period was the drama, where Restoration plays in which uh, everything, no matter how licentious, no matter how ribald, was put on, on the stage. We're going to continue talking today about the events of the Restoration and how they reflected in literature. And we're going to attend to um, not just the major voices and the major figures of the time, but also the genres. In our first half of the lesson, we talked about how Dryden and Milton, despite being from opposite sides of the political uh, spectrum, both relied on ex the same forms, the same idea of a different future, the reimagination re of England in order to convey their points, how the same poetic form lent itself to opposite, uh, opposite points of view. Today we're going to talk about not how the the uh, not how the venerable and traditional form of poetry can achieve that, but we'll look at new forms of writing. For the Restoration led to. A pl the, not just the restoration, but the, um, the full sweep of, the, of revolution, civil war, restoration, and the, uh, the ongoing tumult of the 17th century led to the innovation and proliferation, proliferation of many new genres, new kinds of writing that are just as important to us to take note of as the traditional forms of high poetry. The major form that we're going to talk about today is actually nonfiction accounts, a diary, a memoir, in fact, and we'll also talk about about newspaper writing. Before turning back to uh, to poetry, but a new, a, a, an innovative kind of poetry, satire, at the end of today's lesson, our figures we're going to focus on are Samuel Pepys, despite being written. P-E-P-Y-S. His name is pronounced Peeps. You can see his, uh, his portrait down below. There's Peeps. We'll look at his work in a second. We're going to go back to Dryden and we'll, try, and we'll try to talk a little bit about Afra Ben as well. A lot of this work, you can, a lot of the tumult that you can read about, and I did assign this, I've linked to it on our course page, of the turbulent 17th century, the Civil War, the regicide, the killing of Charles I, the Restoration, the return of Charles Stuart uh, II, um, as, and then we're going to get to, we haven't yet reached the glorious revolution. We'll talk about that. It was accounted for in many different kinds of writing that you can note on this page from the British Library. We'll use a lot of the British Library as kind of our textbook throughout the course. They offer an enormous a wealth of material and criticism and explanation that we'll return to over and over again. And I'm actually going to give you guys, in about two, uh, after Passover probably, an assignment drawing on this um, drawing on this collection. For every period that we study, the British Library, Library has curated a page and a set of texts like this. So you can see scenes from the Civil War and so on. The Civil War and the political unrest that it unleashed led not only to debates about the form of society, but new ways of accounting for it, new ways of reporting it. And before we turn to Pepys, actually, I just want to mention that 
the birth or the forerunners, the precursors of the modern newspapers come from this time as well. You can see here um, one very well-known newspaper of the time, the Moderate Intelligencer, which did have a perspective, as newspapers today still do, a kind of political stance. It was a revolutionary newspaper. It was a parliamentarian newspaper against the king. It advocated the, the uh, execution, the beheading of the king. But these were weeklies that were produced and widely distributed at the time, and they do give relatively impartial accounts of what actually was happening. These, uh, these texts are, are valuable not only, for the, not only for their influence as in leading to journalism um, that still will, would develop over the next hundred years and, and following it, but these kind of short-term ephemera, ephemera meaning transient, temporary pieces of writing that were meant to be circulated, that were giving an account, a written version of what actually was happening in the society is a very new idea. And it also relates to an idea that I will start, I'll mention now, will develop over the next week or so, of giving an observation, of offering an impartial, accurate account of life. And that's something that is obviously tied to all kinds of changes in society, including scientific changes, the notion of observation, and so on. Another figure who participated in observation was Samuel Pepys. Samuel Pepys was a mid-level functionary in the Royal Navy. As I think I mentioned last time, he kind of had a you know upper mid-level, upper level, upper mid-level job, um, although not having all that much expertise. <laughs> he was not a mariner. He's not a sailor himself, but he was a, he was a manager. He undertook to write a diary, a diary that he kept for a full decade throughout the 1600s. And alongside these newspaper reports, Pepys offers the most exact, detailed account of this, um, this eventful decade that we have. And he wrote every single day from his sort of middle, you know, relatively young man in his 20s until his mid-30s. And he is, uh, and he is a social a socialite. He's uh, connected to many people, and he has an excellent eye for observation. And it is another version of what I am trying to to uh, to get at this idea of just everyday individuals, not talking about um, of everyday individuals talking about their actual lives as the stuff of writing. These will be the building blocks, of course, that will lead over the next many decades in the next century to the novel, one of the major destinations, one of the major landmarks that we'll pause at over the course over the course of our of our discussions. Um, the rise of the novel is something that our course covers. And these ideas of ordinary people giving an account of themselves is essential to that literary trajectory. Pepys writes an every day, and here's another an every day about what happened, where he got up, what happened, what happened in that day. Here you can see September first, sixteen sixty six. Gets his uh, what happened at the office. Different folks come in, but he's also a witness to some of the major events that I've already mentioned, and we can look. We're going to talk about it in greater detail now. On the second September, sixteen sixty six, Pepys writes. Some of our maids and they and here in this website, which has the entire diary transcribed digitally, Peep says I it includes the original uh, orthography or or spelling, which was not standardized for a long time after his life. Some of our maids sitting up late late last night to get things ready against against our feast today. It was to be a Sunday. Jane called us up at three in the morning. Jane, as you can see here, is one of the maids to tell us of a great fire that has broken out in the middle of the night. A fire they saw in the city. The city is the downtown or the oldest part of London. It is sort of the city within the city. It's within Great London. It's the where the ancient Roman city was and a medieval city, as you can see. He gets up. He goes out to see the window. And he still thinks it's far enough away that he goes back to sleep. In the morning, 
He goes up and he sees that the fire is, as it says, not so far off. He saw the fire not so much as it was and further off. So to my closet, closet to set things right after yesterday's cleaning, he goes about his day. By and by, the maid tells him that there have been that 300 houses that have burned down. It's gone about the tower. He goes out. He sees an infinite great fire. I saw, there I just see the houses at that end of the bridge all on fire. An infinite great fire on this and the other side of the bridge. His heart, as he says, my heart full of trouble, he goes, to the, he goes out to see to the lieutenant of the tower. He's a person of influence. He can go into different places. And he sees people trying to fling their belongings into lighters or small boats to save themselves. Poor people staying in their houses as long as till the fire very touched them. As we know, disaster visits people of different classes in very disparate ways. And he sees the fire growing, raging every way. Nobody to my sight was able to put it out, to quench it. Going on through here. Eventually he sees, he find, he meets up with the Lord Mayor. At last I met my Lord Mayor in Canning Street like a man spent. He's exhausted. And the mayor did not perform all that well. To the king's message he cried like a fainting woman, Lord, what can I do? I am spent. People will not listen to me. They will not obey me. I've been pulling down houses. That was their only means, really, of fighting the fire to create fire breaks. But the fire overtakes us faster. What Pepys is doing here, and in the next two days, and it's fascinating to read, and I've linked to it on our page, how he does go about his day. He does host his feast. He has, he entertains guests. His house is just outside the ring of fire. While this extraordinary, this enormous and devastating disaster occurs right outside his building, his, his walls. Look at this map. This is where, these are where the ancient, the Roman, the ancient walls that were still there, the city walls and that were kept in medieval, through, through the medieval period of London. This is the city of London within the greater, the larger, uh, greater London, the entire city, all around St. Paul's. Everything in pink was burnt. All of this incinerated. Peeps' house, as he says, it seemed like he wasn't that far off because it started on Putting Lane over, I don't know if you can see this, but right here. Both sides of the bridge he saw were aflame. And he's just outside. His house, home is eventually spared. But the disaster is in great detail described here. It is a, quite an exceptional record, this account that he gives of loss, of suffering, of disaster. And it's all in this very vivid voice with, with uh, amazing detail. Which derive, And he is able, he talks about how he felt, how he, uh, uh, excuse me, how he carried away all my money, my plate, his dishes, my best things. He sent out of the, ta out of the area to get it out of the city. And, to remain, and then eventually he says the, uh, he sees, and even gets his wine, his cheese, Eventually, the, by the end of the week, the fire begins to come under control. But what a sight it was to see. This is the last day of the, where the city was still on fire. What sad, it, what sad sight it was by moonlight to see the whole city almost on fire that you might see it playing at Woolwich. There are characters here. They're real people, of course. There are details. There is sentiment. And then there's we're most invested in Peeps as a readers were invested as Peeps is in his own plight and his own fortune, how he would fare in all this. This is creative nonfiction. This is the building blocks of fiction as well, of novels. In this period, however, we think of the we think of the fire. We are that was all law and it was and it was horrible. As you can see, it destroyed. Uh, 70,000 or 80,000 homes in the city of the inhabitants of, of uh, and it completely destroyed the, uh, the medieval core. But there were other, there was another event of this time in the middle of the 1660s. In fact, one year, the full year before the fire, the year before the fire, and it's often the fire that's anthologized, that is, those are the, those are the passages of Pepys' diary that are most commonly read and anthologized and assigned. But on the heels of our own, our own perspective, 
there is a completely different uh, event that's not described in any one entry, but you can see here how frequently and almost insidiously, insidiously, Pepys describes the plague. Already in one year before the fire, the end of September, the end of, of the middle of September, sixteen sixty-five, Pepys talks to talk about how people are talking about plague. And then he says, "Well, it seemed that it had become under control. The plague is almost abated, almost to nothing." But then, quite wrong, of course, the plague comes back with extraordinary vengeance. He talks about how horrible it was, the cessation of the plague, how many people die, uh, parents of his of his staff, people that he knows, colleagues, neighbors. The number of citations and references to it is overwhelming. People, houses shut up against the plague. God preserve us all. And here is actually a, um, here is a, 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 a museum exhibition, and you can't go to this exhibition during our own experience of the plague. But the plague was a horrible event in its own right. It was not as bad as maybe the Black Death of the 13th and 14th centuries, but it did kill 25%. 25% of one quarter of the population of London in 1665-1666. This is after war, after years, after decades of civil unrest, political unrest. In 18 months, the bubonic plague, carried by rats, uh, lice on fleas and lice on rats themselves with a with a, with a bacterium, killed 100,000 people. The plague in the summer of 1665. Uh, was really actually it was in September that he began to talk about it. There were much early references, and here is an engraving of these events of um, houses being shut up, corpses being carried out, mass graves. In this image that you can see here, of the plague, Lord preserve us all is what is what uh what Pepys writes. The great fears of sickness here in the city had uh, had seized had seized them all. Plague had reached the shores beginning in the spring of 1665 to great trouble. Plague has come into the city, and unknowing how to stop it, ignorant of what it was about, the town grows sickly. Lord have mercy upon us, he wrote. And he saw when he would see the houses as it was marked with that, that were marked with the Red Cross saying that plague was there, quarantining them. The city did try the 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 leaders of the city did try to bring it under control. You can see here orders that were conceived and published. These are rules, as we know from our own experience. The responsible powers, the authorities publish rules that are constantly being amended of how to contend with this to the best of their ability. These orders from on the infection of plague are depressingly similar to ours. Here is a, the inside. Here is a transcription of them. Notice to be given of sickness, the master of every house, when there is someone sick in the house, must report it. Sequestration of the sick, those are the terms we would call it quarantine, bidud. As soon as any man is found to be sick, he shall be sequestered in the house. The house must be shut up, meaning closed up, and no one should be allowed in, and no one in should be removed, should be allowed out. In four, nearly 400 years, these rules are very familiar and quite similar, almost uh, strikingly so. That might be depressing. It also could be somehow soothing to know that uh, societies have gone through this. And societies, and this is, remember, England, and the reason we're taking this course, part of it is because we are going to cover periods of great glory, power, and influence that in the decades following this, England emerged Surprisingly, perhaps if you think about what we are describing now, the wars, the fires and destruction, the death and plague, the pandemic, and then only a few years, few, I mean, to us, seems like only a few decades later, of course, it's a lifetime of separating this. By the early 18th century, England is emerging as one of the, as one of, or if not the great power on earth. These bills of mortality are going to be something that I'll come back to after uh, a after the next few lessons, um, these were bills. Of, these were documents published also by the authorities, in which the names of the dead would be listed. Now, this section 
These passages are also written in about in detail by Pepys, but in a different way, since it was not just one day, it was ongoing. This period of great challenge, this period of pandemic, of plague, is important for many reasons, but one, one, uh, one corollary, one consequence of the, of the plague was that places of education, universities, were closed, something also that many of you may have, may have had experience with. One university that was closed was the, um, was the, uh, was, uh, the university of this, at the time, young man, which was, uh, uh, Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, in the summer of 1666, when the plague was still raging, he was a student, I believe, at Cambridge, and he was sent home because of the closures on account of plague, of pandemic. And it was at his time, back at his, uh, at his family estate in Lincolnshire, that he says, the, the, perhaps this is an account of whether it was true or not, apocryphal or not, that he came upon the nature, to speculate upon the nature of gravitation, of gravity, after seeing as it said, an apple fall from his ancient, from an apple tree among his family's orchards. This discovery of the principle of gravity, of gravitation, um, is, the, is, the, uh, is part of the, the, let's call it the fruit, is part of the, uh, the consequences, one of the outcomes of this period. That's not to redeem pandemic, not to redeem plague, as we know all too well ourselves. But the twists and turns of history are surprising, unexpected, and completely unpredictable. In this period, there are of, of the restoration, so it's almost surprising, or maybe there is a reason, maybe there is a connection to the libertine, the satirical tone, the light hand, the light touch of the restoration that is its mark and this dark difficult uh, challenging history that i'm just that we are that we are discussing some of the writers of the time afra ben um, one of the original rest rest restoration both dramatists and early novelists she is writes a pro a, sort of a proto novel it's called Orinoco. You might come to read it elsewhere. It is actually set in the Americas, and it is about, and it is about a uh, a, a, a slave, an African who himself actually turns out he has uh, royal African parentage, and uh, and the the uh, romance of this individual. Afro Ben also writes a great many dramas, plays. She, like Dryden, is known for these works that are very pleasing, very witty, full of satire, good-natured laugh, and establishing what is thought of as good taste, decorous, proper responses, and a intellectual and tasteful response to culture. These works from, let's say, the 16, late 1670s, 1680s, and into the 1690s are again against the backdrop of challenging events, for it wasn't only the plague and the fire, but the civic unrest did not end with the restoration. To refer here, and then we're going to go back to Dryden in a second to wrap things up for this week and this lesson. But in 1679, and apologies for some of the details here, a new crisis erupted about who would succeed Charles II. Charles II had no, the, rest, the king of the Restoration, had no 
legitimate children. He had many illegitimate children from his many, many mistresses whom he took good care of. But from his queen, he did not have his official consort. He did not have legitimate issue, any legitimate progeny. The uh, the likelihood of succession going to his uh, brother, his younger brother James, was growing as Charles Charles was aging. The problem was that James, or the contention was the point of contention was that James was Catholic. Charles was not religious in any way, although he was very sympathetic to Catholics. He was also uh, officially still an Anglican till his last rites. He was dying when he did take Catholic rites, but James was. And James was a public Catholic. The concern was that James might return England to the uh, to the religious bloodshed and religious strife at the beginning of the century that had eventually led to the Civil War. And there were those who sought to exclude James through Parliament, through some of the illegitimate children of Charles II. This caused a, a crisis that Dryden wrote about in a long and satirical poem called Absalom and Achitophel. And it's actually the poem is the reason that I'm telling you about the crisis. I don't care that much about the crisis. The poem is a landmark text for the reason that it advances what is going to be one of our major genres, another form of writing, poetry, but in a satiric tone. Poetry that is meant to be very funny, poetry that is meant to, and it's a specific kind of humor, poetry that is meant to sort of undermine powers that be or undermine threats, uh, undermine some of the powerful, and to expose the absurdity and the vice of those who are simply thinking wrong, of, of lack of reason. There is an expression of high-minded moral values, as it says here, an expression of what you should be thinking through the sort of ribbing, the kind of funny and witty, always the word that is used is the witty uh, rejoinder. In this text, Absalom and Achitofa, which is, a long thousand-line satiric poem in heroic, fully rhymed, and end-stopped couplets that takes the story of David and Avshalom, Achitophel, the biblical story of David and his rebellious and usurping son Absalom, and the advisor Achitophel, and applies it to the events of the day, but with none of the pathos that you might see in Milton's Samson Agonistes, with none of the drama of Paradise Lost, rather with one witty line, satirical line, after another, after another. Published in 1681, on the heels of this ex so-called exclusion crisis, the text says on its cover, a, uh, it's a little hard to see there down on the slide on the bottom, a, uh, a Latin quotation from someone called Horace, a Roman author who excelled in this form. And it says in English, the translation in English is stand closer, it will charm you more. Kind of the ethos of satire, to embrace it, to embrace being made fun of. And it's so beautifully, so wittily done, the satire will make you want to hear more and more. It's like being taken to a stand-up club, being made fun of, and then thinking, that's kind of funny. I hope they do more of that. In the preface to this work, and it is in English, the, the poem, the, uh, the author Dryden writes that the true end of satire is the amendment of vices by correction. And I want to take that point about comedy, about satire, seriously for a second. For similar to comedy in our age, or at least during maybe a few years ago, during the, the, the Trump era in America, where some of the most serious debates were hashed out in comedy, comedy allowed for the correction as Dryden says, the amendment of vices by correction. It allows for the suppression of what might become violent or hostile opposition 
and it neutralizes it through satire. That there is a, an attempt to control for social energies, for what might have been called during the Reformation enthusiasms. Enthusiasm is the, to in, be enthused, the Spirit of God visiting you privately, and then you thinking you have some truth, right? It is an attempt to keep the lid in a very polite, comic, satirical, witty fashion on urges, on divisions, on, as it says here, vices that could be destructive if not neutralized. And that is one of the purposes that we're going to see satire develop. Here, Dryden is thinking about sort of a metaphysics, a philosophy of this new kind of writing, satirical writing, but I want to point out, but I'm pointing out that it is in response to the events of his day. He's not just trying to be funny for its own sake, but there are urgent social purposes of it. In pious times, air priests, we're not going to read the whole thing. Don't, don't worry about it. In pious times, air priest and priestcraft did begin before polygamy was made a sin, when man on many multiplied his kind, air one to one was cursedly defined, confined, when nature prompted and no long denied promiscuous use of concubine and bride. He's going, I'm going to set my poem in its funny times and the pious times when polygamy was not just allowed, but it was the norm. It was encouraged. When having, when adultery, what might have been called adultery, what is adultery in Charles II's own experience, his many concubines, when this was done by David, when this was, uh, when this was the proper, the proper conduct of even Israel's monarch, when Israel's monarch after heaven's own heart, his vigorous warmth did variously impart to wives and slaves and widened his skin. He's so full of love. That's talking about David, of course, but so too is our Charles II. It is meant to be, of course, over the top, a little absurd. Not over the top, and um, not over the top in a uh, in in a in in, in, a, in an extreme manner. But it's meant to take what might be actual objections, what might be real anger, and turn it into something witty, funny, and and yes, satirical. The key figure here. One of the key figures, excuse me. Here's another example of this. In the first rank of these did Zimri stand, a man so various that he seems to be not one but all mankind's epitome. A person who is, you know, this is here's the Renaissance man, a man of so many different qualities being skewered. He is so various that he seems to be not one but all of mankind's epitome. He is the person who doesn't get the joke. Stiff in opinions, always in the wrong. Was everything by starts and nothing long. He's, doesn't, he doesn't get the joke. He's someone who is simply too stubborn. What, um, what Dryden is trying to convey, and here I'll just pay attention to that, to the, uh, to the, the quote down there. Oh, let me change this so it doesn't, it doesn't um, it don't, so that it won't distract us is that satire, this is Dryden quoting from, again, in, this is Dryden quoting in an essay. He's also very famous as an essayist. We'll leave that aside. He is one of the so-called fathers of the modern English essay, another form that we'll talk about, but we'll leave it for a while. That uh, he quotes, he, quote, he translates and quotes Horace that in his essay on the purpose of satire, the original and progress of satire, Dryden writes, Horace makes it for me in these words. Satire is a kind of poetry without a series of action invented for purging of our minds. This cathartic purpose, which in some ways returns to the comedies of Greek drama, of Greek, uh, not drama, of Greek stage. You know, we talk so much about the dramas. We've read Sophocles. We've read, uh, we've read Aeschylus. But there were, Arist there were the works, the comedies of Aristophanes. There was an entire purpose for of comedy that we don't know about all that much since many of these plays and Aristotle's work on it was lost. But here it reminds us a little bit of that cathartic purpose, that there is a social purpose to this form of art, this literary form of art, the purging of our minds, creating a safe literary space sphere 
that is an alternate, a safer version, an alternative to what in the decades before the Civil War might have led to bloodshed. Human vices, back to the quote here, human vices, ignorance, and errors, all things besides which are produced from them in every man are severely reprehended. Vices are reprehended. Made fun of, criticized, partly dramatically, partly simply, and sometimes in both kinds of speaking, but for the most part, figuratively and occultally. Done kind of in the dark. And this is going to be one of his key points. Consist, consistent in a low, familiar way, chiefly in a sharp and pungent manner of speech, but partly also in a facetious and civil way. It's all done politely, of jesting by when either hatred or laughter or indignation is moved. You might feel that it's the nicest and most, and this is again dried and writing, the nicest and most delicate touches of satire consist in its fine raillery. How polite it is, how fine it is, how easy it is to call rogue and villain, and that wittily. But how hard to make a man appear a fool, a blockhead, or a knave without using any of those terms. To make fun of someone, but to do it in a way that deploys, that makes use of intelligence, of wit, such that the person doesn't even realize that they're being made fun of. The character of Zimri, the character we just saw in Absalom, is, in my opinion, worth, uh, worth the whole opinion. Tis not bloody, but tis ridiculous enough. It is the suppression, or the um, it is the sublimation, right? The rerouting of what might have been bloody, but here through ridicule. He for whom it was intended was too witty to resent it as injury. If you're the kind of person who understands these texts, if you're a person of good taste, you realize, well, that wasn't that bad. The injury is not one that I'm going to maintain. It is the real blockhead Someone who is not even worth the joke is who can't understand it, who bears a grudge. A person of real society, a reader, a person of wit, a person of manners, the man of good taste, can both dish and take, can both produce this kind of satire, be comic and witty in this manner, but also take a good joke, even when it's on them. So we can see... In closing, the forms as be, forms of literature responding to the uh, events, the emerging events of the day, and also somehow taking the reins of helping to control what happened. In the last few events, because I don't want to keep talk, we're not we're not I, we're not uh, going to keep uh, being too confused by the. I hope we don't stay confused by the uh, by the political upheaval of the time. James is eventually the successor to Charles, James II, the Catholic brother. And all seems well until in the third year of his reign, he does have a child. Um, the assumption actually was that he would not have any children. He did not when he, when he took the throne. And he was also what was then aged. He was in his 50s. But he does actually have a son, who then becomes the heir apparent. And when James moves to make his son the heir apparent, panic breaks out that there will be a new dynasty of Catholic monarchs. And he is deposed very quickly in the span of only a few months, really one month. The reign of James II comes to the end, comes to its, comes to an end in the form of what's called in, six, in the summer of 1688, in June 1688, the Glorious Revolution, or also called the Bloodless Revolution. Another revolution, not just the, uh, the, the English Revolution of the, the, the Civil War, but, um, but nobles um, make contact with the leader of Protestant Netherlands. There are many, many contacts and points of... Uh, uh, may, a deep relationship between Protestant England and the Netherlands at this time, something I'll talk about next week. And William of Orange, Prince William of Orange, the leader of the Dutch Republic, is invited to invade England. He is married to a member of the royal family, to uh, Mary. And William and Mary take the throne 
1688, deposing James, who goes into exile. It leads to something we call the Jacobite. This is just in case you are interested in this. The Jacobites, there is a, another branch of uh, British supporters who maintain that the, the Stuarts, James and his child, and then actually even his grandchild are the rightful heirs to the throne, even when they live in exile. This goes on for about almost 100 years, by the way, the Jacobites. But the, um, but the new dynasty or the new, the new rulers are Protestant. This ends, this ends the unrest. This ends the doubts about the questions about what will be the religious character. And as part of the agreement with William and Mary, this, who, who rule together for 13 years, they allow for what's called the Bill, English Bill of Rights, part of the unwritten, the uncodified British Constitution, which stipulates very clearly that the monarch must submit to the consent of Parliament, cannot just dismiss Parliament. This institutes the situation the, that has continued in various forms with, with a series of revisions and reforms since that England is a constitutional monarchy. The monarch is not absolute something we'll talk about at great length next week. We'll go back and talk about, we'll read John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, and how this comes to be, but that the monarch is ruled by himself or herself, the consent of the people, agreement with the people. Um, the, uh, the, the reign of William and Mary is a prosperous one, is followed by their actual Mary sister, Queen Anne, who, uh, who rules also for another 12, 13 years. Her life is also, there are two important things here, the Act of Settlement, which further susses out, it clarifies the, the lines of succession. And the, uh, and the other element that I just want to make you aware of is that the Great Britain, the, what will eventually become called the United Kingdom, is consolidated during Anne's rule, such that England which is the lower part of the island, together with Wales, they had been allied for many centuries, are joined, they are brought into, an, officially joined into Scotland. They had shared a monarch for a while, but now it is made official that they are one country, Great Britain being the entirety of the island, Scotland, Britain, England, and Wales. This sets up England, and then after this, actually, there's a new dynasty, uh, a king that is brought over from, from Germany, in fact, a prince from Germany is made king, that's George, and there'll be the Georgian period, and we're going to talk about that period in a few weeks' time. But these changes, these reformations, allow for stability, just as, as we had said, a satirical, the mode of observation, the mode of, the mode of writing in, in good taste, allow for a suppression, a controlling of the urges, the enthusiasms, the impulses, that had been so deadly, so lethal, so destructive earlier in the 17th century. That'll conclude things for this, for now in our first lesson. When we come back for next week, we're going to be talking and we'll be reading philosophical readings, again starting with Milton, then Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, about the state, the nature of English society and its political arrangements. Bye.